Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Daum. Before I tell you about this week's guest, Jean Twangy, a couple of announcements about the Unspeakeasy, of course. The first is that our online community is up and running and hopping. If you haven't joined yet and you are a woman, you should really check it out. I'm not just saying this. I'm actually in the community all the time. I love it. It's kind of like a little mini Facebook without all those people that you can't stand on Facebook. We have different discussion forums. We talk about politics, culture stuff, books, movies, feminism, gender, education, parenting, all kinds of stuff. With uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say like-minded women because... People certainly do not agree on everything, but uh, there is a common thread with just critical thinking and openness and a real desire for, you know the word, nuanced conversation. So please do check it out. You can go to theunspeakeasy.com. It is $99 to join for the year right now. That's going to go up pretty soon, but that's the introductory price. That's pretty reasonable, I have to say. That's just $8.25 a month. So I will see you there, hopefully. Please come in. Also, the Minneapolis Unspeakeasy Retreat is coming up. It is May 8th through 11th. The overnight spots are sold out, but we are letting people come as daytime participants on May 9th and 10th. Time is getting tight, but if you're interested in that, again, go to theunspeakeasy.com and write to us and let us know. We have some amazing speakers and just a great schedule and it's be shaping up like a great event. Also, June 24th and 25th, Unspeakeasy weekend retreat in Austin. That's going to be a daytime only weekend retreat. So check that out too. Everything is at theunspeakeasy.com. Okay. My guest is Jean Twenge. Even if Jean's name is not immediately familiar to you, there's a good chance that her work is. Jean's research about generations and what defines and divides them has been integral to the work of Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, including in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which I think gets cited around here at least every other week. Jean is the author of seven books, including Generation Me and iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, Less Happy, and Completely Unprepared for Adulthood. Her new book, which also has a very long subtitle, is Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future. In this conversation, Jean talks about what she's learned from working with a data set of 39 million people born between 1925 and 2012. She dispels some of the more common myths about certain generations, for instance, that millennials are broke Guess what? They're not. They're doing better than the boomers were at that stage. She talks about the concept of fast versus slow life strategies. And she just has some really interesting and surprising tidbits. For example, did you know that there were more women enrolled in college in the 1930s than in the 1950s? Think about that for a minute. Jean stays overtime for paying subscribers to talk about one of my favorite topics, my generation which is also her generation, Gen X, what's good about it, what's hard about it, why we tend to be forgotten. Maybe that's one of the things that's good about it. If you want to hear that part, become a paying subscriber at megandown.substack.com. You get lots of perks there, as you know. In the meantime, here is the main part of my conversation with Jean Twangy. Jean Twangy, welcome to The Unspeakable. Thank you. I'm really excited to talk with you, not least of all because I have for a long time been interested in what makes generations unique, especially the sort of more subtle kinds of social, psychosocial kinds of differences that are harder to articulate sometimes. I've also been told that this concern is something of a frivolous one, that it's kind of a like get out of jail free card for being unwilling to change with the times. So I guess I want to start by asking you, why is it important to talk about generational differences? And why is it so easy for these discussions to get sort of reduced into like a 
kids today get off my lawn kind of gripe. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's interesting. Older generations are often very interested in younger ones. And younger generations tend not to be as interested in older generations. They think that they know it all or it doesn't matter to them or they don't see it as as as, as crucial. So it's studying generational differences has often been something that is characterized in that way of it being older people finger wagging, you know, at 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 younger ones. Um, it's actually one of the reasons that I got into this field in the first place. I'm a Gen Xer, and when I was in college, um, I was reading a lot of stuff written about my own generation, and it just wasn't based in much real data. I mean, sure, they had demographics from the census and things like that, but they'd say things like, you know, oh, Gen Xers have low self-esteem. Like, wait, what? You know, did you actually ask anybody or do a survey on that? So that was something I was interested in. Well, you know, how about we instead go to the source, ask people these types of questions? So when I first started looking at this, it was kind of standard surveys that are used in psychological research. And then um, more recently, it's been just big national surveys, often of young people. And I like that approach a lot because it means we're going straight to the source. You know, it's not about finger waving. Um, it's about, hey, what are young people saying about their experiences? And how is that different from what young people said 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And that gets around, I think, a lot of the very natural defensiveness in this area. of Like, oh, you know, you're trying to describe my generation. It's like, well... Yes, uh, but it's based on these analyses of what young people say about themselves. You are known to, I think, a lot of people for your work with Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukiana for Coddling of the American Mind. I know they drew a lot of their sourcing from, from your data. Talk about how you collect data. You're working with very, very large sample pools. I don't know what the correct term would be. You're, you're working with like big, big, big swaths of information. And so your, your work is different from somebody who's just kind of a, sitting around making observations about things. So, so tell us sort of what your, what your process is. Sure. So, you know, historically, I've worked with a lot of surveys of young people. So one of them is called Monitoring the Future. And it's such a kind of a lame name, but it's an incredible resource because they have surveyed um, high school seniors every year since 1976 and eighth graders and 10th tenth, tenth graders every year since 1991. And they get a national sample across the country, so kids from every background, and ask them a ton of questions. And then you can compare those responses. So I've worked with that, that data set and others on young people a lot. Then for the new bug for generations, I kind of broadened my perspective because we look at all of the generations. I wanted to also look at adults. So I ended up um, working with 24 different data sets, um, a total of thir- about 39 million people filled out one or the other of these surveys. So it's just you know, a lot of number crunching. Most of these are um, government funded. Most of them are freely available online. Most of them go back at least a decade. Um, in some cases, there's one they, um, on, on elections that goes back to 1947. There's some census data that goes back that far too. And um, just wrangling all, all of this data to try to get a picture of um, how the generations differ and how um, each is kind of unique in this current cultural moment that we're living through right now, which is a really weird cultural moment in, in so many ways, as as you know from your own writing. Yes, really weird is a good way of putting it. <laughs> you divide your book, and this is a very long book. This is like well over 500 pages. You divide the sections into the different generations, and you also sort of punctuate each of these sections with what you called an event interlude. So for instance, you talk about the silent generation, and I think it might actually be useful to just kind of run through these categories and what the years are, because I think people get confused. Okay. So, and we'll just talk for a few seconds about each one. So the silent generation are the people born between 1925 and 1945. uh, And that's distinct from the greatest generation. Let, let's talk about what the difference between those two groups are and why people tend to confuse them. Yeah, so the greatest generation is those born roughly you know, 1900 to 1924. So that's the generation who 
fought World War II. Okay. That's what they are really known for. The silent generation, for the, for the vast majority, were too young to fight in World War II. So some people have called them a very lucky generation because although some were drafted to fight in the Korean War, they kind of were in between World War II and Vietnam. Right. Okay. And is, does fighting World War II, is that what makes the greatest generation so great? Most people would say that, yeah, that um, okay. they lived through the Great Depression, um, oh. they lived through World War II, and, um, and, and then afterward, you know, were the folks who kind of built the 50s, 1950s, in a lot of ways. Okay. So their, their trajectory was, was very much, uh, you know, American heroes, and then coming back home to, uh, oh. you know, build, build families in the whole post-war culture. Okay. I always wonder where that name came from, the greatest generation. Okay. Uh, so the silence, those are born between 1925 and 1945. You talk about their event interlude being the AIDS epidemic, which that was interesting to me because I always think about the AIDS epidemic as shaping my generation, Generation X, and, and maybe younger baby boomers. But an event interlude is different from something that that was sort of already baked into one's life experience. So, and, and shape, shaping it. And I, I, you know, those, those event interludes were not necessarily meant to be associated with one generation versus another. I just took big events and then put them, you know, in basically in chronological order. So AIDS definitely impacted boomers and Gen Xers as well. It's just that's kind of where it where it fit in the chronology. Right. Okay. So now why are the silence called silent? So it comes from a Time magazine article in the late 1940s talking about the people who were in college at that point. And you know, just that what that generation was described by was quote, their their silence. And I think it may have stuck based on the whole culture around the 1950s domesticity and tradition that it was the greatest generation who started to build that, but then it was the younger silence who came into that world and uh, were the ones who were married among women were marrying at 20, you know, had two kids by by 25. I think what that label really gets wrong, especially from a long term perspective, the silent generation were the people who were at the forefront of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. And in, in a lot of cases too, you think about the uh, gay rights movement, Stonewall, that was silence. Um, mm -hmm. Those three huge movements, which really had a you know, big impact on the country and how people lived, were mostly led by silence. You think about the silent generation, two most famous members, Martin Luther King, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Even if you just think about it in that way, you can see how much of a misnomer that label is. Right, right. Okay. All right. I want to drill down on a couple things about the silent generation, but just because I said I was going to do this, let's just go through a taxonomy really quickly so listeners are oriented. So we have the silence, we have the boomers. They were born between 1946 and 1964. We have Generation X, born between 1965 and 1979. Millennials, born between 1980 and 1994. Gen Z, and I'm always confused about the boundary between millennial and Gen Z. Gen Z is born between 1995 and 2012. And then we have something called the Polars, which were uh, starting being born in uh, 20, 2013. So we're going to talk about it at the end. But, you know, one thing about the silence, there's like you have these extraordinary details in here about marriage patterns and something that was really surprising to me this marrying young and starting a family young and having lots of kids, that's not something that was going on like in the 30s. You say women's magazines in the 1930s featured independent young women who explored other interests before they got married. I don't want to put you in a garden behind a wall, said a young man to a young woman in, in a 1939 magazine story. I want you to walk with me hand in hand and together we could accomplish whatever we want to. Wow. That is really different from what came later. And I think with what a lot of people perceive about people in the past. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, cultural change is often linear. 
It is true, but sometimes it's not. And this is an example uh, where it's not linear that it, I mean, depending on your perspective, you could see for women's roles that it sort of went backward um, in the fifties, considering it had been heading in the direction of um, more freedom and more focus on women, ha women having careers you know, in the 1920s and in 1930s. And I have to give credit where credit's due. I did not go and find that magazine article from the 1930s myself. You know who did that for me and for us? That was from Betty Friedan in The Feminine Mystique because that's something that, that she did in writing that book is she went back and looked at all this cultural stuff from the 1930s, which she remembered because she was alive at that time, and how she you know, perceived that there was just that huge shift after the war toward mo more domesticity for women. Yeah, that's funny. I remember reading The Feminine Mystique. I, I remember this. It was clearly, it was the summer of 1990. So I would have been 20 years old. And I don't remember that part of it, actually. I remember reading that book and thinking like, oh my God, what a terrible life she's describing. <laughs> like, this is terrible. Thank that God that's too. over. I know. Right. Right. Exactly. I, I read that book when I was 13. Uh, so 1984-ish. Uh, and yeah, I had sa same reaction. Okay. So what are the other things that are most surprising about, let's say the, the silence and then, and then moving into the boomers, say the, the older boomers? Well, you know, one, one thing is really interesting about the silent generation is their mental health. So one of the big surveys asked about days in which people felt stressed or had poor mental health. And the silent generation looks better than the greatest generation before them and the boomers after them in terms of having fewer days where they felt like they were in poor mental health. And then we have you know, big surveys during the pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the silent generation, they were the most vulnerable. They are our senior citizens who you know, are, were the most at risk for COVID, but their mental health was actually the best during that time. The ones who are the most on lockdown and the most at risk, but it might be just because they came in that moment in history of a fair amount of stability and not as many of them served in a war like World War II or um, Vietnam, even though some did go to Korea. Oh. Okay. But wouldn't we think maybe they would be less inclined to even think about their mental health? Like how much of that is kind of just the the mood and the sort of values of that demographic. Well, if, and I think what you're saying is, and this, you know, this is a, something you always have to consider in this type of data is, you know, well, could it be that they're just, you know, the older people, they're just, you know, mental health wasn't as much on the radar when they were young. And so they're just less likely to say, you know, that they had times when they're in poor mental health. So if that was the case, then we wouldn't see a curve. We would expect it to be a line that then you'd see that even more for the greatest generation, that they would even more not be willing to say that they had days of poor mental health. And that's not how it looks. It's a curve. Okay. So you talk about something that you call the fast life strategy versus the slow life strategy. And I think we see that start to manifest more and more as we go sort of into the boomer era. Talk about what that means. Yeah. So, you know, so the, the theory at the core of the book is that the idea that generations are based around major events isn't really true. That you sure events have an impact on people, but it's technology and the things that follow from technology that have the biggest impact. So one thing that follows from technological change is people tend to live longer. Infant mortality goes down, so people have fewer children because they expect that they're going to survive. Education takes longer to finish because the world is more complex, so it, it takes more years of education to be successful in the economy. All of those things push for the the for life to, to, to slow down, not day-to-day -day life, which, you know, the pace of that has, has picked up, but in terms of how many years of life you have and then how quickly or slowly you hit different milestones. 
So the slow life strategy happens when people live longer, happens when people have fewer children, happens when education takes longer, that children are less independent. Teens are less likely to do adult things like have a driver's license or have a job or go out on dates, or go out of the house without their parents. Young adults marry later, have children later, settle into careers later. Older people usually are in better health than older people are when you know, the life expectancy is shorter and, and health is, is worse. So that's where we get the idea of 60 is the new 50 mm. and people having years of retirement to enjoy. So the whole trajectory slows down. And you mentioned with boomers, boomers start to slow things down. So silence got married for women at about 20. Boomers only ticked that up a little bit. In 1970, 21 was the median age at first marriage for women. So, But what they did do was they ticked up having children to a little bit older. They waited longer to have children, and more of them went to college. So that's where you get um, some of, of young adulthood slowing down uh, b- between silence and boomers. And why do you think that they were still getting married at such a young age in, in the early 70s? Is it because of birth control pill hadn't been around as long or abortion was not yet legal? Like, do you have any thoughts about that? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, you know, compared to now, it was a, definitely a much faster life strategy than, you know, sure, more boomers are going to college in silence, but not half as many as now. And there were, it was still, the standard was still that you got married in your early 20s. That was the cultural norm. And it really took until Gen X and especially millennials to break that norm. Okay. Yeah. So let's get into Gen X. That's our generation. So you, you say Gen X had the shortest childhood and longest adolescence of any generation born in the 20th century. What do you mean by that? So Gen X is a, an interesting generation when it comes to the slow versus fast life strategy. Because on the one hand, you look at young adults. Once we got to young adulthood, we'd married later, had kids later. But then just remember, so our uh, fellow Gen Xers out there, anybody remember the early 90s? Go watch an old episode of ER and you know it will remind you <laughs> of um, some of the stuff going on back then with the, the crazy high violent crime rate um, and a lot of the you know, the huge um, increasing teen pregnancy. All, all of that was what you know, Gen X was, was grappling with at, at that time. And that's what you, what you see, that childhood got shortened in some ways for, for Gen X because of um, those kind of gritty realities of that time with teen pregnancy going up and the violent crime rate. But then adolescence kind of got lengthened because more of us went to college and then married later, had kids later. You give an example, for instance, of today, we'll just jump up to the present moment for a second, of say a 21-year-old young man who say he wants a wife, like, soon and he wants to start a family like he's really interested in just going into that kind of life now he would be seen as extremely unusual he a lot of people would be talking him out of that kind of mindset telling him he was a lot too young and so only a few decades ago that that would have been the norm exactly yeah that would have absolutely you know been looked upon as the right thing to do you know in 1955 or even 1965 and had he married young, then probably would have had lots of other friends who got married in the couple years after that. And it would have been very common. And it's, it's an example that I used to illustrate how cultural change has an impact on all of us, even if we're not typical for our generation or for our time. That if we're out of step, then you know that 21-year-old, he might have a harder, much harder time finding a young woman who would get married. And then if he did find that then he'd be, they'd be the only one among their friends who were married and it would still have an impact on them. Does this have to do with people being less religious? So that's certainly part of it. I mean, that, that is absolutely a trend that um, you know, I document in the book in the, in the chapter on, on millennials 
is that there there has been a big decline in affiliating with religion and going to religious services, even private beliefs, belief in God or praying privately. All, all of that, you know, has systematically gone down. Um, it's just less common among um, people of of all ages, but particularly among young people. And that may play somewhat of a role in marriage being pushed up, but even among groups that are religious, the average age of marriage is, is still gone up. So there's there's probably some role for religion, but uh, arguably even bigger role for the slow life strategy. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's try to understand a little bit more about the slow life strategy because so when you say Gen X had the shortest childhood and the longest adolescence, it's really like we sort of grew up really fast, right? We wanted to get our driver's licenses. We were the latchkey kids. We couldn't wait to get out of the house. Being a young person, like youth culture was, of course, romanticized. And there's a high value placed on being young. But at the same time, you didn't want to be that young, right? Like you wanted to be a young adult. You didn't want to be a kid. And But then we started to get into the sort of idea that we were a bunch of slackers and we couldn't commit to anything and we refused to grow up. So I'm, I'm actually wondering, you know, in the beginning of this conversation, you talked about how when you were in college, you were seeing, you were reading all kinds of generalizations about your generation. Um, are those the kinds of things you were hearing that didn't sound right to you? I mean, some of it did, some some of it didn't. So, yeah, at the time, it was like, say, early early nineties is really when Gen X got its name and reputation. All supposed to be depressed and we're black and be slackers. That was, you know, kind of the rep yeah, at the time. Not care. We were supposed to and not, not care. care. Right. Right. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, I think I think you know, looking back, you can you know realize a lot of interesting things that would later make us stand out, like that we actually wanted to get our driver's license. So teen, teens now much less likely to, to get that driver's license. I had a, for my last book, uh, a young man said to me, um, oh, you know, I didn't get my driver's license because my parents didn't push me to get my driver's license. And as a Gen Xer, I'm like, what? are you talking about? <laughs> it's the other way around, dude. <laughs> You're supposed to push your parents to me to let them uh, allow you to get the driver's license. So that's just a, a you know, big, a big shift. The, the, the movie License to Drive, by the way, is the one that I recommend in this area for checking out the Gen X attitude. That's an 80s movie. The two Corys are in it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Corey Feldman and Corey Hart. Anyway, so the uh, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman. But it's all like he gives this big speech about how, you know, getting the, the driver's license is all about freedom. And there's literally like a flag waving behind him and the whole thing. And this is what it was about, you know, for, for us as, as Gen Xers is you're absolutely right. You know, when you're 15, you really want to be 16 to get the license. When you're 16, you want to be 18. When, when you're 18, you know, you want to be 21. And then beyond that, you're like, okay, now I can stop getting older. But, you know, that goal is to be 21 to be able to do everything. Um, <laughs> I guess there's a sweet spot there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's, but then, you know, that's it. Then 21 is good and you kind of put off some of the other signs of adultery. You start putting it off, but not half as much as um, millennials and Gen Z ended up doing after us. Let's get into the millennials. You know, it's it's a cliche at this point, but the the Gen Xers don't think highly of millennials often. The boomers, because they're the parents of the millennials, I think are a little more charitable. So maybe we can talk about that dynamic. But okay, so what are the things about millennials that are the stereotypes that are true? And what are the stereotypes that you have found are untrue? So one uh, thing that comes up a lot is millennials being very confident, being very optimistic, um, having a lot of faith in themselves. Entitled? Is that what you mean? Are you trying to avoid Entitled, using that word? Entitled, you know, certainly would end up, you know, in, in that category. And to an extent, that is, is true. So if you look at um, entering college students, say, and whether they describe themselves as above average in their leadership ability and their drive to achieve, <laughs> in their self-confidence, yes, that tops out. With millennials. To be fair, Gen Xers started that trend. They started upward, you know, when the college students were Gen Xers. All of those things about just thinking highly of, of your abilities. 
is definitely in there. Uh, narcissistic personality traits increased um, among college students between early 80s when it would have been boomers through Gen Xers and then peaked uh, around 2008 and then went down, interestingly. So when you talk about entitlement and narcissism, there's it's kind of a mixed bag. There was a big increase for the first part of the millennial generation and then it actually declined. So that's one thing where there is at least some truth to it, that entitlement, that optimism, those, those very high expectations, absolutely very high expectations. I'm going to get a great job. I'm going to get all this education. The world's my oyster. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be famous. Absolutely there. That soured a, a fair amount as um, millennials have moved into adulthood. Mm-hmm. A lot of that optimism is, is uh, no longer there. So that's one place where the stereotype has turned a little bit. One stereotype that it turns out is definitely not true is that millennials are broke, that they're going to own less than their parents, right? So, I mean, that one is pervasive. You see that pretty much everywhere. Everybody's always talking about stagnant wages and have to have three jobs and the side hustle. And, you know, we're never going to do as well as our parents. Guess what? Late capitalism. They are the victims right. of late capitalism, whatever that right. means. Yes. Right. Exactly. It's all, all of that discussion, you know, very, very negative. It turns out the picture for millennials economically is actually very, very positive. Median incomes for 25 to 40 year olds are at or near all time highs. They're wow. actually doing better. And this is corrected for inflation. They're actually doing better than Gen Xers and boomers were at the same age. Even in terms of wealth, where admittedly, you know, millennials are going to have a little bit of a later start because more went to college. So for a good reason, there was a study a few years ago by the St. Louis Fed that got all kinds of attention. Oh, millennials are falling behind. Guess what? They updated their data. And now millennials are neck and neck with Gen X at the same age. So even in terms of wealth, millennials are doing really well. All right, let's talk about Gen Z for a second. I think I tend to get confused here. So how old is the oldest Gen Zer at this point? By my definition, 28. So there's there's always going to be debate over the, the, the cutoffs here. So I use 1995 as the first birth year for Gen Z or iGen, as I sometimes call them. Okay. Based on some of the trends in the data, based on there's a pretty definitive break in the data on teens around 2012. And so that works out a little bit better for the for that cutoff to be 1994 for millennials, 1995 for Gen Z. Pew Research Center um, uses 97 as the first year uh, for Gen Z. And I've stuck with 95 just because it fits the data, but it's two years. It's not that far apart. Okay. So you have a book called iGen and you do point to this concept. So iGen and Gen Z are the same. So yes. why are there different terms? You know, nobody ever knows what to call a generation and there's no commission that decides it. It's just whatever ends up sticking. And it's sort of odd that Gen Z ended up sticking because Gen Y didn't stick for millennials. So it's like we skipped a letter. Oh, that's right. They were Gen Y. That's yeah, right. Exactly. I've always thought that a lot of people don't like the label Gen X. I actually think it does fit. You know, X is the letter for an unknown quantity. That's kind of us. Yeah. It, it makes some sense. But why would you then say, okay, let's let's keep using these letters? You know, it's just not very creative. Yeah, well, it, we're it's, pretty far down in the alphabet too. You're going to run out of That's the problem. Then you got to start over. You know, so that idea of millennials being Gen Y, you know, it's just, I never thought it would catch on. And sure enough, it didn't. But then I didn't think Gen Z was going to stick either. And it sort of has. So we'll see. I've heard another label is Zoomers. And I kind of think that's clever. So that maybe that one will stick for the um, post 1995 or 1970. 97 uh, generation. Okay. But iGen, did that have to do with like the iPhone? Yeah, that that's the idea. Because so this generation is the first to spend their entire adolescence in the age of the smartphone. And that had ripple effects across many, many areas of their lives. I mean, that's what really, that was the piece of technology that really cleaves them from the other generations. Okay. All right. Well, so now that we've kind of broken this down in technical terms, what if we just sort of like pull the camera back here? What do you, Gene Twangy, think of this kind of mishmash of different ages of people and different sensibilities and different approaches to the to the world? I mean, how 
much of the sort of current distress and just frustration over why things are the way they are have to do with these generational divides? I think a good amount. And maybe that's that's partially also just from my position as a Gen Xer. You know, we're the middle child of generations. And that's how we are. We're caught right there in the middle and observing on either side of us this change. Or maybe it's just being 51 years old. And that's what happens when you look um, you know, at what you thought was your group of people and said, wait, hold on, you know, this is not what I had in mind when I said that, you know, there are certain things that need to change about the world. That might just be a product of, of, uh, for a lot of, a lot of generations, you know, being, being at that age. Uh, But I I do think generation gaps do start to explain a good amount um, of some of the odd things going on in the culture at the moment. Like what? What comes to mind? Um, can- cancel culture being one example, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> you know, and the 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 idea that everything is political. Now, to be fair, that that's that's something a lot of generations are participating in. But a lot of these things that pop up in terms of free speech and cancel culture and politis, you know, on politics, are very often pitting Gen Xers against millennials and Gen Z. More so than boomers. You think it's pitting Gen Xers against them? I I think boomers are in the mix too. Yeah, boomers are in the mix too, for sure. Um, But a lot of the most high profile examples seem to involve Gen Xers kind of looking at situations and really, well, I mean, I think and vice versa, the millennials looking at Gen Xers being, I don't understand you. Yeah. Or do they not understand us or they just, they can see right through us? <laughs> Sometimes I think it's that. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think they understand where we're coming from. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember, uh, I, I somehow, I can't remember exactly what the context was, but I heard somebody refer to me, I think it was a student sort of like, oh, I just, you know, she's not all bad. She just has some old fashioned ideas. And I thought, wow, like, I don't think the term old fashioned has ever been applied to me (laughs) until that moment. It was quite jarring. But but old fashioned values would mean like, I don't know what. Well, I think to a Gen Xer, you hear old fashioned values, you you think of of the 1950s. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're not you're not thinking of something like, let's have that speaker come to campus and not get shouted down. But we associate making everything political with the boomers, right? The personal is political true. started with them. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so it, it is of a different, a different flavor. And maybe that, maybe, maybe that's why it's often Gen X who's kind of in opposition there with, you know, in, in a lot of these cases that I think, I think Gen Xers, at least at times, prided themselves on on maybe not being as political as the boomers. And then maybe now they see this in younger generations and that's where there's this generation gap again. Right. Well, one thing that I've noted is that I feel like sometimes I have more in common with a boomer who might be as much as 20 years older than I am than I do with a millennial who might be as little as seven years younger. There's just such a massive divide that I guess was is the result of technology and of social media. I mean, what, what, what do you think? That that's possible. I mean, I think that that's, um, you know, a, a fascinating question to try to puzzle out. And that's certainly part of it, that the way people interact online is fundamentally different from the way that they interact face to face. And things just get polarized so much more quickly online because People will, you know, say things online that they would never say to somebody's face, uh, and their positions just become more extreme. And then the other thing I've gotten kind of interested in lately is just how negative so much, so many things are on social media. Like they're either like super positive, like here's my perfect life on Instagram, or it's the world is completely on fire and everything is 
terrible and awful and things are worse than ever. And that seems to be the viewpoint of a lot of people on social media, maybe in particular, a, a lot of Gen Z. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's catastrophizing. There's, yes. Yes. Everything is at the extremes. I mean, like another thing too, and actually I, I've written about this and I was surprised and delighted to see that you've quoted me in, your, in the book, like even something like seeking mentorship, you know? So like when I was in my twenties, I would have been thrilled to get the wisdom of somebody who was a couple decades older than me, somebody in my professional field or something like that. And I find now that when younger people ask me for advice, which isn't that often <laughs> for obvious reasons, that I can't, I don't know what to say to them because it's like they're asking me, my frame of reference is an extinction. Like the world that I came of age in doesn't exist anymore. I can't be of any help. And I sort of feel like this is a giant problem, which is it's not even that they're not asking for it, our advice. They shouldn't. Right? Because it's not event, it's of no use. Yeah, I mean, it, it it is just different. I mean, everything being done online and through social media and with smartphones is is just fundamentally different. And you know, I, I want to step back from that a little and say that there are certainly things about life that are the same, and so maybe they should be asking us for advice. I do have three kids and two of them are teenagers. So I have to say, you know, please ask me for advice. Uh, but it is true when they're like, you know, some certain thing happens over text. I mean, I didn't have that experience as a teenager. I don't know. And what do you mean you use the skull emoji to mean you're laughing? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that means. Okay. That is what that, that is. The that skull is skull like means the, laughing. Yep. That is cause like, I'm dead. From laughing. I don't oh, know. That get is it. The, but it's, that is the most Gen Z thing I had ever heard when I heard that that was for laughing. I'm like, there you go. Right. I mean, you talk a lot in the book about mental health, the way people perceive their own mental health, the way they report uh, in, in surveys about mental health issues. But we also hear about how, like, younger generations it's almost like they're so consumed with their own mental health that it makes them less mentally healthy. What do you think about that? Yeah, it, it, it's a tough thing because, you know, I am you know trained in psychology. I don't see patients. I'm not a clinician, but still I have to look at, at young people bringing attention to mental health issues uh, and reducing stigma around that and, and applaud that. I mean, I think that, that, that is absolutely fantastic that we are making it more, that they are making it more acceptable you know, to talk about these issues and to seek help. Very, very necessary. On the other hand, there's certainly the argument that if there's too much conversation that's very, very negative online, that that may not be the best outcome. Um, that may not be the best way to solve, to solve this, this problem, depending on how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's just one example. I've I've heard people talk about teen girls end up ending up effectively being a therapist for their friends, and that's very very emotionally draining. And then they end up depressed themselves. And so that's what is concerning: is if it becomes this negative conversation all the time, and you're doing something you're not trained for. Wow. Which is you know basically being a therapist for all of your friends. I, I I think that that may make the problem worse instead of better. So I think we just have to find a better balance with it. Of yes, let's talk about this, but let's try to find the best avenue for a solution here. But how is being a therapist for your friends different from just listening to your friends? Well, it depends. Um, I mean, honestly, it's if most of your friends are depressed, then that becomes you end up playing playing that role, right? So they've identified themselves as depressed. It's not just like we would call our friend and and complain about whatever and our friend would react. This is a sort of more formalized interaction. And it's actually that they are, you know, more of them are depressed too. So, you know, that that the problems are bigger and more severe and the emotions, you know, are even worse than than they are just with, you know, say normal problems or 
or sadness. Right. I also think about like the whole bullying culture. I think that, you know, people have taken a lot of credit, rightfully so, for really kind of stamping out that kind of culture in schools. Like the idea of getting beat up in the schoolyard as a kind of rite of passage, that's really not acceptable anymore. Not that it doesn't happen, but we don't see what we saw in the 70s and the 80s. And before that, of teachers just kind of looking away or, you know, boys will be boys. And, you know, sometimes girls are beating up other girls. That has really become unacceptable. However, as you have pointed out, and as Jonathan Haidt has pointed out, the bullying now has just gone to the phone and it occurs 24 hours a day. And it is arguably much, much, much worse. Yeah, because you can't get away from it. So it's always there. So if you're a you know, teen and you have a smartphone and that smartphone's always there, then there's always that potential for for bullying and insult. And, you know, it's not, it's not even just the bullying either. It's that maybe you put up that picture on Instagram and it doesn't get as many likes as you want it. I mean, there's, that's at the low level. And then in, it's the people who will then comment that you're ugly. I mean, there's just so much opportunity for things that you know are hard to take at any age, much less being 13 years old and seeing that. Yeah. And we always pride ourselves on our resilience and grit, right? But I wonder, like, I think that sometimes it's easy for us to not react to stuff that happens on Instagram and then sort of chalk it up to being more resilient or just like not being indulgent. And the fact is that we just, we don't have as much skin in the game. Like Instagram doesn't really mean anything to me, (laughs) but to a 13 year old, it could mean everything. So I sometimes think that we're a little bit like self-righteous about, Oh, just get over it. And that, I mean, that's, that's certainly another area where I think there's a, there's a really big generation gap of, of understanding and where each side has some good points. You know, I think Gen, Gen Z will say, you know, you don't, will point to Gen, Gen X say and say, you don't know what it's like to have your whole life online and to have people commenting on it. And Gen Xers can say, yeah, you know, you're right. But then Gen Z will come and say, you know, oh, but we have all of this trauma from living right now because of climate change. And then Gen X will be like, yeah, but we thought the world was going to end through nuclear war. How is that any different? Right. Right. Yeah. So the trauma idea, when did that start creeping up? Is that something that started happening like in the late eighties? Is this like in the world of sort of more people going to therapy and recovered memory syndrome and that kind of thing? I mean, certainly, you know, therapy started to become more common in hmm, 1970s and has, has built from there. And certainly more discussion around mental health, particularly when SSRI antidepressants came out in the early 90s, that also brought a lot of attention to, to depression because it was suddenly more treatable. So there's a lot more conversation around that. So that, that discussion about being more open about mental health issues has been going on for a really long time. I think one thing that has changed in the culture is uh, that use of the word trauma that used to be used for for things like maybe war or sexual assault. And now many, many people have argued that that word is overused, that it's used for everything. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, <laughs> the whole trigger warning, content warning, whatever it is. Do you teach? I know you are an academic. Do you have students? Are you actually in a classroom? Yes. And are they graduate students or undergrads? Uh, They're upper division undergraduates. Okay. So they are Gen Zers, right? Yeah. So what kinds of things come up in in the classroom where you say to yourself ever like, oh my gosh, this is exactly exactly what I found in my data and now it's playing out right before my eyes? Yeah. Um, Well, you know, I've, I've... I've been doing this for a long time, uh, and I've been on on my um, San Diego State campus since 2001. So I've seen the generation cycle through, and I definitely there's def- there was definitely a change about 10 years ago in that transition between roughly 10 years ago between millennials and Gen Z, mm-hmm. because uh, millennials are much more likely to talk in class. Uh, but they were also much more likely to argue over grades mm. and ask to take the final at a different time. 
Um, <laughs> because of because of mental health issues or just because of entitlement, ex- exceptionalism. Entitle- yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then that 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 did you know start start to change. And so you know it's a, it, it's a trade off because the Gen Z students are nicer, but they're less willing to talk in class. It takes a lot more to to draw them into conversation. Wow, because they're so unused to having in-person interactions that might be part of it um it's it's also because there are trade-offs to overconfidence overconfident people might argue about their grade but they also talk in class right right so you're finding that gen z's are not overconfident is what you're saying are they underconfident like they have self-esteem issues like what's going on with them yeah, I mean that's that's certainly what I mean. You know, there's not any one cutoff for what's healthy levels of self esteem, but certainly compared to millennials, they are a lot less confident and lower in self esteem. Hmm. Hmm. You know. Also, I wanted to ask you, why is it that you think that so the Gen X is the parents of Gen Zers? Yes. Much. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So I have noticed that for all of our, you know the pride that we take and being so independent and we just rode our bikes around until sundown and we did whatever we wanted and we, you know, got our driver's licenses the minute we could. We are raising the most dependent, fragile, delicate kids. Gen Xers are helicopter parents. And I have some armchair theories as to why that may be, but I'm curious what your theories are. So I think it's a product of the slow life strategy that I think it's not just parents. I mean, if if a Gen X parent wanted to raise their kid like it was 1988, they would pretty much be arrested. Right. As our right? I mean, if you, let, if you let your kid out, roam yes. around the neighborhood and ride the bike and, and, and do all that stuff, um, I mean, then there have been cases of that, of the family who let their 10-year-old and 6-year-old walk home from the park a mile away and the CPS took the kids away. I mean, these are extreme examples, but it's in Illinois, it's actually the law. You can't leave a kid alone until they're 14. Gen Xers were babysitting. I just read that. that Like, I was babysitting when I was 12. Right, exactly. You know, so this is how times have changed. So it's, so, you know, I I, I hesitate, you know, with, with these things to just talk about parents and just talk about Gen Xers and so on, because the whole culture has changed. You know, it's, it has shifted. It is, it is, it, you know, probably in response to that slow life that we don't expect 13 year olds to be as mature as they used to be, or it's not even really mature that they're just taking longer to grow up. And so they're not going to babysit anymore. Instead, they can't be left alone. It's that, you know, whole change in thinking. And some people have tried to make the argument that, Gen Xers were underprotected, so then they wanted to overprotect their kids. And there, there may be some truth to that, but I, I think it's mostly that slow life strategy combined with income inequality, which gives Gen X parents the idea that their kids are either going to make it or they're not, so they better make it. And it's really competitive and they need to make sure that they're doing all the right things. Yeah, I've heard that as a rationale, just that they're so, so, so scared that their kid is not going to have the opportunity that they had that they're just going to drive the whole family crazy. Like basically the, the, the nuclear family is a sort of class ascendancy project, not even ascendancy, but like just trying to stay on an even playing field, just trying to stay where they were. I think yeah, that's exactly it. Right. Right. And it's, you know, parenting as a verb and that if your kid doesn't get into the right school that you failed as a parent, it's kind of counter, it's very counterproductive that, that whole rat race. It's hard though, because I mean, you have kids. I, I don't have kids, but I've just been noticing on social media, even over the last few weeks, people are talking about their kids hearing from colleges and they're applying. And it's like the, the parents are people who went to top, top, top tier colleges, Ivy League colleges. And the kids, you know, maybe a very, very tiny percentage of them are able to get into those sorts of schools. But for the most part, they're going to places that we've either never heard of, that we would not have considered. By we, I mean the, the, the parents, not collectively. But I mean, it is pretty remarkable and horrifying how much harder it is to compete 
now. This is the one thing about being Gen X. I always feel like because we were so small, we we're such a small demographic. Like when it came to college, like we sort of bought low and sold high. <laughs> like a lot of us could never get into the college that we went to now. Right. True. But, you know, that's also because kids apply to more colleges because they can, because it's easier to fill out the application online than when we had to type them. You remember that? Oh. So that's part of it. Um, it the, the other thing is the vast majority of high school students end up going to, to colleges that accept the majority of their applicants. I mean, this is the thing. More, more kids are going to college now than when Gen Xers were young. Right. So the idea of like, oh, these kids aren't going to go to college at all. Probably not. They probably are. They're just maybe going to go to one that isn't quite as prestigious. I mean, it's, it's a pretty small number of campuses that are have gotten harder to get into. There's a lot of campuses that accept 80%, 90% of their applicants. People just don't talk about those. It's not as interesting. Okay. But the other thing I would say too, is that you're probably going to get a pretty good education no matter where you go, because it's so hard for academics to get jobs. That's true. So, you know, there's so, so many, you know, very intelligent, highly qualified academics looking for jobs and willing to go anywhere to get a secure position that you're pretty much guaranteed to have excellent faculty no matter where you go, putting aside whatever we think of what's happening in humanities departments, et cetera. But you know, yeah. So, well, before we shift this over, I mean, I think that a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep you and we're going to talk more about Gen X in the, in the bonus portion, but I just think a lot of people are torn because it's very, there's something very sexy about talking about generations. I find it fascinating. I find it kind of like incredibly satisfying to sort of look at myself and my own experience in relation to others. But like, how useful is this information? And I guess, how can we best use it? When you go and talk to companies, for instance, like what kind of advice are you giving them? Like, how can we really take what you've gleaned and do something positive with it? I mean, I think first it's just, it's a matter of perspective, but that why should we talk about generations? Why should we you know, analyze all of this data? It's really about understanding. Then we don't have to guess you know, what the differences are. Uh, we don't have to wonder if, if you know, is it just my perception? Go and listen. And that's what it's about. It's about listening. It's about understanding. That's what it's about for me. Um, that's why I wrote the book is let's try to see what we can really find out. And I think that's really useful. Uh, let's just, you know, try to understand the perspective of other generations. So if you're a manager looking at your young employees, just, yeah, realize that they grew up in a different way. I think it has to go both ways, though. It also means, you know, young people just remember that it was a different world for older people, and that's not necessarily bad. You know, we all bring strengths and weaknesses to the table. That's how that's how it begins. Of we're not stereotyping, we're not trying to wag fingers. It's about understanding. Okay, well, that's very diplomatic, but something like if somebody thinks that they don't have to come into the office ever. <laughs> What what should one do with that? Well, so you know, it 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 is a balance. You know, have to have to realize we all have these different perspectives. But yes, there is a bottom line if you're running a business. And yes, there are some things where you're going to meet people where they are, but there's others where it has to be look. That's just the way it is. So, like when I have a student, and I had a student who said this once, I have to take the final late. Because I'm going to Vegas for my birthday. I'm like, <laughs> okay, there are 275 people in this class. We are taking the final at this time. And, you know, that's how it works. Because my thought is I teach upper division undergraduates in a year. If he says it to his boss, I have to miss the big presentation because I'm going to Vegas for my birthday. How's that going to go over? Not well. That's amazing. So what did, the, how did the person, were they upset when you told them that they had to take it on that day? Um, a little bit, but not as much as you might think. I mean, it kind of reminds me of in general with, I guess people in general, but maybe I'm particularly thinking of um, a parent to a teenage child. Sometimes I swear, you know, you just have to set the limits. 
Right. And they, they actually kind of know that. I, I was actually on a, on a panel um, just last week at, at a small college and it was um, a coach and then three faculty members and then a student. And the student actually said, you know, I want you guys to know, I actually do want you to set deadlines because then I, I, it's there and I can meet it. And we're all like, what? Really? You actually want us to set deadlines? Yeah, that's why that, they, yeah. yeah. That's right. why they buy, spend money on these productivity apps. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I wonder, actually, I'm just thinking of this now, like, because we've had all these uh, sort of decades of parents not setting limits, there's a huge market for people like getting these apps that force them to do a thing at a certain time, accountability. That's a really growing market. And it's because it hasn't been imposed upon them by human beings. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny, I think, you know, whether you could ask that question, you know, so is it that parents are helicopter parents and are forcing their kids to do all these things? Or is it that we parents have set back and said, you know, no, we're not going to have any roles. And it is sort of both. I think it is sort of both in a strange way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so before I let you go, explain what polars are. These are people born between 2013 and 2029. P-O-L-A-R-S. Yep. So Polars is after political polarization and melting polar ice caps. Oh. Two big issues that will shape this generation and their future. Um, So these were the kids who were poor things, you know, preschoolers and kindergartners during the pandemic. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're doomed. The silent generation was that age during the Great Depression, and they turned out pretty well. So maybe they'll have um, some strength born out of adversity. Hmm. Okay. All right. That's that's hopeful. I mean, but do you think, again, I know this is not your area, but like the fact that the pandemic is really not going to go away for a lot of people. I mean, this generation, there will be a cohort that is forever profoundly marked by that experience? I think that's a little bit of an open question. I mean, I think the learning deficits, for sure. I think that that's probably going to stick with us for a long time. The mental health outcomes were not as bad as we might have expected. I mean, they were bad, but they continued previous trends. They didn't actually get hugely worse. And I remember reading something about what people said about the 1918 flu pandemic, that after it was over, nobody wanted to talk about it. And I wonder if we're in that era now in the 2020s. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, Jean, I'm going to keep you uh, for a little bit longer for the paying Substack subscribers. And we're going to talk about uh, how you feel about being the age that you are among other things. But in the meantime, congratulations on the book. This is uh, Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future. It's mandatory to have an extremely long subtitle on your book. Now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Especially for my books, they all have a really long subtitle. Yeah, but it's good. It's like you got a short main title. Right. So, good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with me, Jane. Thank you. That was my conversation with Jean Twangy. She is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University and the author of numerous scientific publications and seven books, including Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future, just out this week, publication day, April 25th. So go buy it. What else do you need to know? If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, go to megandaum.substack.com. It's not really the rest of this conversation because this was very much a complete conversation, but I've been keeping the guests over time to talk more casually and more personally. And so you're missing a lot if you don't hear that part. So please consider subscribing and hearing it. What else? Theunspeakeasy.com is up and running and rolling as an online community please consider joining it. The next retreat is in Minneapolis, May 8th through 11th. You can become a daytime participant on May 9th and 10th. 
Austin, Texas retreat, June 24th and 25th. I think that is all I have to say for now. So I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you.